Good evening uh, and welcome to the Cabinet meeting of Tamworth Borough Council on Thursday the 14th of March. Um, first agenda item is apologies for absence. I'm aware of apologies from Councillor Thompson. I believe we're all here. Yep. Um, minutes of the previous meeting. Are there a true reflection? Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? All those in favour? Thank you very much. Any declarations of interest? Okay. Question time. I'm not aware of any questions from the public. So that takes us on to the first main item. Matters referred to the Cabinet in accordance with the overview and scrutiny procedure rules. And we have a report of the Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. So please, Councillor Bain, come and present your report. Thank you, Chair. The Overview and Scrutiny Committee, the Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee, did consider the housing assistance policy and received three recommendations. One, to review and consider the, the proposed assistance within the policy, and we did that. Uh, second was to comment on the inclusion of various discretionary schemes that were proposed. We did that and commented on them in great detail. The third recommendation was that we would formally recommend the policy to the Cabinet. We were not able at that meeting to find either a mover or a seconder for that recommendation. And there were two reasons for that, Chair. Um, the first was that um, we felt that the officers needed an additional resource in order to clear the backlog of reviews that were taking place because the current system couldn't operate effectively under the weight of that backlog. Second part of that um, difficulty was the way in which priorities for the scheme were set. And we were still retained a number of concerns about the ways in which priorities were set. At the moment, it appears to be largely focused on date. And we felt that was a, not an effective way of dealing with people whose needs were um, made them amongst the most vulnerable members of the community. So we had a, a um, proposal moved by Councillor Bailey and seconded by Councillor Doyle to look at a proposal for providing extra resource to assist the Assistant Director with the backlog and review of the process. The second point, um, which meant that we couldn't approve, we couldn't recommend the policy um, to the Cabinet, was that um, the priority about um, for those who have been medically discharged from the armed forces was no longer present uh, on page seven, and it was moved by Councillor Maycock and seconded by Councillor Doyle that page seven should include that as a priority so that our veterans could be properly treated. So I, those are the two um, recommendations that we're putting to the Cabinet here today, Chair. Thank you very much for presenting that. Um, over to Councillor Smith, please. Yep, yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Councillor Bain, for that. Uh, it was a robust uh, conversation during health and wellbeing, so it was, uh, it was appreciated. Um, I suppose what we'll do is, first of all, I'll just say that um, I think what we discovered, I suppose, that is... The, the addition to what was the policy, I don't think there's huge amounts of negativity which was above what was essentially a mandatory policy. The discretionary stuff, I don't think anybody had necessarily a big issue. I think what came under scrutiny was essentially, you know, where are we, certainly with the backlog, um, and what's the long-term strategy and plan around it, certainly in terms of um, reducing those numbers um, and then of course you have got the the priorities which doesn't cons uh, exist at the moment but what was proposed to go from urgent and, and standard um, and of course you know I absolutely do agree that there has to be um, some provision for um, discharged members of the armed forces so moving on to um, the recommendations so if we're looking at number three um, so what we're saying there is uh, propose uh, the proposal for providing extra resource to assist the assistant director with the backlog and review of the process. Uh, I can't argue with that. Um, we definitely need to look at um, um, proposing where extra resource is required. Of course, what we need to do is be very 
careful about that and not certainly sort of waste uh, waste any anybody's time we need to properly look at that so of course that's conversations that i'll be having with the assistant director um so yeah happy to uh, to move that and number four um i think this is where and i did allude to this during the meeting we do have to be a little bit careful um because of course we want um we want a sense of prioritization for as i said to um those of um you know, were armed first, uh, forces pers personnel, certainly medically discharged. Um, what we want to do is not have a situation where we have uh, a, a, a section of, of that grouping um, being potentially above prioritization to say, for example, a, 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 a vulnerable single mother with, with, with vulnerable children. We, we, we can't just sort of say a blanket priority Based on that, we have to we have to sort of review it and see. So I would I would um, look to amend that slightly, and I hope you would be supportive of that. So the amendment to uh, number four would be to look to revise the housing assistance policy to include a provision that grants medically discharged armed forces personnel a degree of priority, and that's the key word there, degree. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bain, do you want to come in there? Yes, I mean, I, I, can, I understand um, because we did have a long discussion about how priorities were, were looked at. And I, th I think the point that we made during the committee was that we signed up to the Armed Forces Covenant and you cannot simply set it aside because it became inconvenient at this point. And I think I did make that point during the meeting. And I, I would think that the signal it sends out by setting a priority for people who've been injured on active service and then discharged from the army on the basis of that do, um, do require some sort of prioritization, perhaps more than what you're saying now, Chair. I don't think a degree of priority covers what we, we were saying. So can I just um, <clears throat> ask a question there? The way it's worded at the moment here currently, the page seven includes a priority. It doesn't necessarily say that it's a priority above everyone else, does it? In the way it's worded, it's just that they get a priority within it. Um, Councillor Cooper, did you want to come in? Yeah, I thought you put your hand up. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. I think um, so. There's a couple of points I need to make. Um, I, I I agree with uh, with Councillor Bain um, with regards to the covenant. I think if we've signed up to the covenant. We've got to honour it. Um, I think the second thing I would like to make is um, actually that there aren't many people who are medically discharged so it, the, the the action doesn't talk about everybody that's just come out of the armed forces it talks about of those that have been medically discharged from the armed forces and if you've been medically discharged from the armed forces that you usually means that you have you're in a bit of a bad way you you are probably one of the most vulnerable in society anyway you have your the, the support net that's there that is in the armed forces has, has gone, you've been medically discharged, you're unfit for them to find you another role within the British Armed Forces. And that can be from logistics to frontline to everything. You you are, you know, you're, you're in a fairly, you know, vulnerable state anyway. So I think that point um, has got to be made. And it doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen very often that actually people are medically discharged from the from the Armed Forces. And I worry that um, if, we, you, if we amend this in any way, we are losing sight of that a little bit. I think I think I agree with you. If it was just about everybody coming out of the armed forces, I have a sense of agreement there. But if we we're talking about people who are medically discharged from the armed forces, doesn't necessarily mean they they they've been medically discharged due to um, active um, frontline service. I'll, I'll say, but what it does mean is that they're physically very restricted. In what they can what they can do so restricted that, that, that they could no longer find a role for them within the british armed forces itself okay thank you so to confirm then your support of the original wording councillor cooper oh. yeah sorry i lost myself there i was having a sip of water um yeah no i i agree with the original wording and with um councillor bay councillor smith yeah, I was just going to say it's it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, we we basically are all in agreement that they should be a level of priority. I mean, I suppose what I'm saying is, you know, I suppose I've sort of reworded it in a sense because, 
you know, when you look at the fact that this housing assistance policy needs to be revamped, and let's be honest, we need to, you know, properly look at it, it might not even be on page seven, you know, at the end of it. So I'm just making sure all um, everything's, if you want, um, you know, we can take out degree if you want, absolutely fine. So, you know, armed forces personnel of priority, given priority. Well, can, we, can we remove page seven? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Oates. I'm just trying to understand this because obviously I wasn't part of the conversation at, at scrutiny. Uh, the, the covenant uh, and the responsibilities and, and the additional priority in terms of armed forces, uh, service people is already covered on page 20 of 77 of, of the report. So in terms of their priority, there, there's an, a, a, a priority attached to, uh, to armed, service, uh, armed forces uh, service people. In terms of priority around medical discharge, I would have assumed, and I may well be 100% wrong on this, the priority is because of the support they were re receiving within the armed forces when they're in the armed forces. In terms of housing, etc., other industries also provide housing and care and support which aren't in the armed forces. So. I'm trying to think of a good example. The only one I can think of is farming, which isn't necessarily supported housing, but there's housing provided as part of as part of a person's employment. Um, so how do we ensure that we don't end up with a list of we will prioritise these people, plus these, plus these, plus these, plus, plus these, because they're in supported housing as part of their industry, uh, but also continue to highlight the priority around those that have been me medically discharged from, uh, from the armed forces specifically. So that's, that's my concern about this, is there are specific industries that have supported housing provision, which when they leave those industries through injury, illness, whatever, they're in a similar situation to somebody in the armed forces who suddenly loses that same level of, of support and, and housing, etc. Did the um, debate start because it was previously in there and had been removed in the updated version? Is that what you referred to, Councillor Bain? I think it was more that Councillor Maycock expected to see it there. And I must admit I did too, because we signed the covenant, so I did expect to see it there. OK, any other comments, Councillor Cooper? Yeah, I'd just like to come back on uh, Councillor Oates' point. I think there's, there's two main differences. Um, yes, there are other industries that probably do have that, those support bases in, in, in place, but they those other industries didn't sign up. The, the, it, it's, it's very different when you sign up to, to join the British Armed Forces. You're making a very big sacrifice in that in doing that. I mean, that's the first one. The second one, we don't have a covenant in and around other industries, only people from the Armed Forces. Councillor Smith, do you want to come back in there? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because I, I suppose the I suppose the legal advice, wasn't it, on this was, as far as I understand it, was that the Armed Forces Covenant doesn't apply. But it, that seems strange to me, and it, it just it doesn't mean that we shouldn't we shouldn't look to do it. So I I definitely agree. I mean, to sum up my my feelings on it, that I'm I'm just saying there needs to be a provision of priority, but. We need to, it needs further discussion because I do, as, as sort of Jeremy Oates um, alluded to, um, you know, you can't have a situation where there's just so many different bands of prioritisation. Yeah. Uh, we need and and, over, and and potential for overlapping as well. So it needs a it needs a well thought out because in all of this, what you don't want to do is rush anything. You need to absolutely look at the specifics, and that you know, in quite frankly, takes a lot of hard work to do that. So. So I, I do agree. I'm just, I suppose I'm just trying to word it in the right way um, that it can be properly reviewed. Yeah, I would just say that if we, the wording that's there, if we change page seven to say the housing assistance policy includes a priority, it's not saying they get the absolute priorities. It's, it's, it's still as a review to then see where they fit in a priority. Uh, Councillor Oates, you want to come in? I'm just looking at paragraph 3.3.1, uh, the Armed Service Act. Uh, 2021, I'll get the year right this evening, uh, places statutory duty on local authorities to give preference uh, 
to former members of the armed forces, etc., uh, etc. Et and the last line, special consideration is appropriate in some cases, especially for those who have been injured or are bereaved. Would it not be better to include this here as or medically discharged in that paragraph 3.3.1, which already talks about preference uh, for those in the armed, armed forces anyway, and, and beef up that that paragraph to include that priority? Yeah, I think that's why if we remove the page reference and just go in generally, it, we can put it where we see we see fit. Councilor Smith, you want to come back in? I can see your finger hovering. I was just going to say, if, if you guys are happy with that, um, I'm happy with that. Okay, so is that you moving, Kim? Yeah. Seconder? And we're voting on, on both of them, yeah? All those in favour? Great, thanks for the discussion and thank you, Councillor Bain and uh, your committee for bringing this forward. Thank you. Um, next item, allocations policy and management of the Council's housing register as report of the portfolio holder for housing and planning. Councillor Smith. Yeah, I'm going to defer straight to the Assistant Director, uh, Tina Staff of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Cabinet. So um, I'm sure you will have all read the comprehensive nature of the documents before you. So this updates and assesses the impact of our current allocations policy on the management of the Council's housing register. So simply how we allocate and how we prioritise and ensure equitability to access you know, social housing. So it modernises it in terms of the regulatory requirements, not least the new Social Housing Regulation Act, as well as all the relevant housing act and um, harmlessness legislation so it is covered covered by statute and, and and a range of codes of guidance so you can see there's a comprehensive piece of work done supported externally to give it that um, um, sort of external accreditation and that review and endorsement is attached as part of the report and the appendices so you'll see along with the report that there's a detailed policy clearly marked with what are the changes Appendix 2 shows you a summary of where there were areas of compliance and non-compliance and what we've done to update that. Um, Campbell Tickell, who supported us, have also produced a detailed evidence pack um, supporting the proposed recommendations. There's a community impact assessment there, um, as is standard in terms of all our equality obligations. And then there's also a summary of consultation out on allocations uh, per se, which closes on the 26th of March, and some of the implications for that, which is attached to Appendix 5. So, in brief, this is good news in that you'll, you'll remember the last time we significantly overhauled the allocations policy was in 2019-2020 so over that over the last four years what the data shows us is that on our register um, numbers have reduced from 1535 to 438 that fluctuates give or take depending on who joins and leaves the register um, but it also shows that it's largely compliant the changes that are proposed are simply to modernize it given it's been four years ago since we um, you know, we last updated it in full. And that good news is supported by the fact that across general needs, you'll see waiting times have reduced in all bands. Um, and certainly when we're talking in months of a reduction in band one, for instance, of a waiting time from five months to three months, you know, that contrasts sharply with other authorities up and down the country who talk about 20 and 30 year waiting times. Um, so it certainly has been successful in terms of reducing people's time on the register, although as the report cautions, it's more an art than a science because people will often wait for a particular property in a particular street. So, you know, I would urge you not to suggest to your constituents, oh, that's how long you'll be waiting because it's, it's, you know, caveated with a number of variables. Um, but in terms of the numbers, that's good. It's compliant. Waiting times have, have, have dropped. The recommendations around opening up the financial threshold. So instead of 60,000 per household, it's now 70,000 is a positive change. And you'll see from the data pack that that's borne out by average incomes in Tamworth and will mean that, you know, that will include and allow access to the register than, than previously. 
And because that's a positive change, it doesn't require statutory consultation on that basis. So the summary of changes are set out in the report at 3.3. The main change is around the financial thresholds, which is, I'll say, is a positive change because more people will be able to join the register than before. Um, there is a section around the Armed Forces Covenant because in the legislation that has been specifically strengthened to say we must include priority banding now for those in the reserve forces as well um, so that's been that's been included but you'll see from the summary of changes and from appendix two that the rest is um, you know the rest is minor in terms of making sure it just fits with the latest guidance so there are three recommendations chair um, the first one is to endorse the updated allocations policy in full set out to Annex 1, recognising those changes at 3.3. In particular, the financial thresholds are increased. The second recommendation is to delegate to the portfolio holder for housing and planning further work around the local lettings policy for the high rise because what the data pack does show you is waiting times are slightly longer for the high rise. Now, that's not because... Um, th that's not because you know there's any, been any impact in the changes previously. That's because some of the um, sanctions around under occupation have meant we've had to advertise it more times in order to let them. Um, but we need to do further work on understanding the options around that and making sure it contributes to the council's wider agenda around place before we make for firm recommendations to you on that, because that would be subject to statutory consultation. And then the third recommendation is you will see as well with sheltered, waiting times are also longer. Um, but when we did a detailed look at that, that's because the bed seat accommodation in sheltered is much more unpopular than the one and two beds. So the proposal is we link that to the work um, Paul's doing on the asset management strategy to look at the reconfiguration options around that. So again, no firm proposals on that until we've done that piece of work. Um, but I'm sure you'll join me in thanking the team for the work that they've done on that because that has shown not only the decisions that were made four years ago have had positive impact where actually this is robust and fit for purpose going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's a, again, a detailed and robust piece of work, another example of a significant undertaking completed this year. So uh, well done and thank you to the team. Obviously, it's great to see the register significantly reducing and to see improved waiting times. Um, and to see that our waiting times are a few months compared with, you said, I'm assuming you meant 30 months at other authorities, not 30 years. Wow. Okay. So then, our, yeah, although we don't want anyone to wait, in comparison, our, our waiting times are excellent. Okay. Do we have any um, comments or questions, Councillor Smith? Yeah, I was just going to say absolutely fantastic work, um, definitely very uh, detailed and I, I think the report that Campbell Tickle did as well was uh, very, uh, very detailed and, and certainly, you know, ensured that the, the regulations currently are uh, taken into consideration. There's clearly more work to be done on the high rise um, uh, situation. So, um, yeah, thank you very much and uh, yeah, give my regards to the rest of the team. Keep it. Uh, yeah, just a quick comment. I mean, thank you for recognising um, our Armed Forces Reserve personnel as well. Um, they're playing ever more of an active role um, in in the you know in, in the long ago it was when I was sort of active service it was your Saturday and Sunday crew. Now it isn't. The reservists do make a fundamental um, impact. So thank you for recognising those as well. It's good to see. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I'm assuming Councillor Smith, you're happy to move. Do a seconder, Councillor Cooper. All those in favour? Brilliant, thank you very much. That moves on to item seven, exclusion of press and public. Um, so we need to consider excluding the press and public from the meeting by passing the following resolution. That in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities, executive arrangements, meeting and access to information, England regulation 2012 and section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of Schedule 12A to the Act and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. At the time of this agenda, 
no representations have been received that this part of the meeting should be open to the public. So can I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? All those in favour? 